Ladies and gentlemen, whenever you watch chess games on YouTube, you are likely following some of the greatest chess players either currently or in history. Well, shout out to Frederick Marone because he sent me a game that was played by two strong grandmasters, but ones that are not so widely recognized. The setting were in Maintalen, Germany, actually technically Western Germany in 1979. Uh, and the players involved are Eric Lebron, who at this time of the game is not a GM yet, and Roman, or Roman, Jinjicashvili, who's a famous American Grandmaster. Some of you might have heard of him, some of you may have not. And this game was decided by one pawn. It was an amazing game, let's take a look. Um, G3 was the move chosen by Lebron, uh, whose name I can never read without cracking up, because it makes me think of Lebron James, so I call him Eric Lebron sometimes. E5, bishop g2. This is a very non-committal system by white, who chooses to, uh, to just give black the center completely and opt for this setup with knight f3 and castles. And essentially, white is playing the king's Indian or Peart setup, but with the white side. So knight f6, knight d2, castles, e4. This is what white does. White delays for a very long time the move e4, ultimately putting a pawn in the center. Both players bring their rooks, anticipating the opening of the e-file for the rooks to pressure the center and black plays knight to d7 now you'll notice both players have actually committed their knight not to the traditional center square and have also blocked their bishops this is because the king's indian setup is a is has a certain maneuvering possibilities for both players before they go and commit this bishop because the truth is like for example if black were to just commit this bishop uh, bishop to e6 blocks the rook and actually weakens this, and the bishop can just be a target. Uh, bishop d7 doesn't develop the bishop at all. That's a very superficial developing move. And this move, which does look very natural, just invites this. And the question is, are you going to take, or are you going to go get your bishop locked away on g6? So, you know, black decides to play knight d7, c3, and now we see this knight move in action, knight to c5, attacking the pawn on d3. Um, queen c2, and the first trade... Now we've got a clarified situation in the center of the board. The center is completely locked. Bishop drops back to c7. This move activates the queen and tries to jump the knight into d3. So, in response, white plays the move bishop to f1, making another bishop move but covering the d3 square. Now the players uh, just push a pawns two squares, uh, jostling for position of control of queenside squares. The truth is that anytime you have kind of a locked position, the more space that you win, the better. Like in Battleship, the more space you win, the more you can kind of identify where the ships are. That was probably a terrible analogy, but I'm going to edit, I'm going to keep this in and I'm not going to edit it out. Bishop g4, and as I said, white welcomes the arrival of the bishop saying, what are you going to do? And Roman plays bishop h5. He's like, look, man, you can go g4, but that's a weakening of your position. My bishop will immediately line up on this pawn, and I've got the horses in the back, so uh, e4 is looking quite under fire. Knight h4 is a very interesting move, basically saying your bishop will never go back. If it does, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to have the bishop pair. So black plays knight fd7. That's an interesting move. Lining up an attack, not really, but, um, you know, just having vision, maybe preventing the move g4. So knight c4. So as you see, both players have met on the queen side, queen f6, and the knight drops back to e3, still fighting for the light squares over here. Queen rotates to e6. Now this queen stands as a beacon of hope. It is the lighthouse of the black position. Knight to b3 is a possibility to attack the rook and this bishop over here. So white plays bishop c4 attacking the queen. Now, this actually kind of looks like a waste of time by black. This move, getting hit with the bishop and then coming back um, because it gives white time. And white capitalizes on that gain of time by winning even more time attacking the queen. So if black backs all the way up, that's just kind of idiotic because what have you done? You've just danced around and went back. It's like you just gave white three, four moves in a row. So instead, Roman does this. And uh, white is now clearly better. Uh, white has the bishop pair. White has a space advantage. White is the only player with the light squared bishop, and it's got just a very clear target. So that bishop will hang out on that diagonal, and now white will also utilize the space advantage on the king side, and, by the way, have the open h-file to attack. So white's position looks very nice. He brings the knight to f5, knight g5, king g2, and white's plan is fully in motion. Black plays knight c5, and now um, white has a couple of ways of building the initiative. Just very slowly, bishop 2e3, or f3, making sure that everything is protected, then bishop e3, rook h1, but LeBron 
<laughs> Lobron, low, low Bron chooses to play bishop takes g5. Now that is an ultra committal decision. I mean, that move, you need to have a clear plan of attack because you've just given the bishop pair back to your opponent. You don't have the bishop pair anymore. Well, you haven't given it back, but you, you've given it up. And now rook h1. And, I, and, and you know, I, I suppose uh, Lobron's decision there was the fact that uh, now the knight no longer protects h7. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. And it's important to note that opposite colored bishops always favor the attacking player. And the reason for that is that the knights can kind of counterbalance each other and the knight can, you know, change its course of light or dark square control. A dark squared bishop cannot prevent a light squared bishop from attacking. So that's just the best way to think about that. Rook d8. Now white takes on h7. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can we just back that up for a second? Excuse me? I thought we were going to slow play this. No, no. He's not interested in doubling the rooks. He is interested in rook takes h7. What? Now that doesn't look like the fairest trade. King takes h7. And here, rather than giving a check or, or, or doing some crazy attacking move, he understands that the king is going to back up to one of these two squares. So bishop takes f7. Now, this is absolutely terrifying. So first of all, rook h1 is a devastating threat because black will need to lose the queen to save the king and then the king is just dead. Uh, white has exchanged a rook for two pawns. Now, the next, uh, uh, the next 10 moves are absolutely insane. This game just goes totally bonkers and this is why I decided to make a video of it. So, black plays the only move. The only move that doesn't lose the game, which is the move rook to e6. Uh, now the move rook to h1 would be met with the move rook h, excuse me, rook h6. And after takes takes, black does give up a rook for a knight, but is up a piece, right? Black gives back a little bit of material, but saves the king, which is the most important part. So for that reason, white actually has to take the rook first. Now black plays knight e6, and you can go rook h1, but you have to play this first, queen b3. Why? Because you utilize the weak's king position and you don't let it go to g8. So if the knight just goes back to f8, rook h1 is devastating because, uh, and as well as queen f7, replacing that bishop, right? So black now has to play uh, a defensive move, right? Nope. Black decides that he's actually the one attacking here and plays knight to f4, check. Okay. So that knight can be taken with pawn takes f4. But that's very dangerous because now queen g4 check. If you drop your knight to guard, pawn takes f4, and I'm about to win your knight. Your only move here is something like rook to h1, and I just go forward with my king, and you don't have any more checks. You have two very powerful pieces, but no checks. You cannot get close to my king. In the words of Chael Sonnen, the undisputed greatest of all time, I can't let you get close. King g6, I can't let you get close. King g6 and you're dead. So... Roman sacrifices the knight with knight to f4 check, and LeBron actually has, he can take it and survive, but he chooses to play king to f3. And king f3 is an ultra provocative move because everything looks protected over here, but here comes black with rook d3 check. Now that looks like mate. That looks like straight up checkmate. It's not because you have knight back to e3. Okay. Um, and it looks like your position just, you know, getting back, getting started again. You're going to go here. I'm gonna go queen f7. Also, at the end of the day, you can go here. Let's not forget that's the other thing about the queen is that you have queen takes b7 wrecking the entire side of the board. Now, he could have taken on f4. Like I said, he could, he could have done this. And then in this position, uh, he would have had to find the move queen f7 again and try to play that position. He opts for king f3 and he's gotta be damn sure that he's gonna, he's gonna win this game. So black plays the move queen h6. Why? Well, in the middle of an attack that's very belligerent on the king, you need to still prevent rook h1. Rook h1 would have been very strong. So queen h6 is the only way to prevent the move rook h1. Okay. And now white plays the move pawn takes knight. Okay. Anticipating the fact that queen f4 would be met with this move when the king is actually safe. Yes, black can play queen e4 and that does look scary, but there's no checks. You can't take here. You can't go here. You can't go here. You can't go here. Completely safe. And that's probably what white was thinking when gf4 was played, but black found a dynamite move here. Rook d2. The simplest, the coolest of rook d2s. And you are not going to run away from me. I'm not going to let you run away. That's called a mating net. You are weaving a mating net. And if the king goes to g2, well, 
well, we'll see what happens, right? Like, King G2, now black. And, and by the way, there is a threat of Rook to H1 here. Defended. So how does black deal with that? Danger levels. What's worth more than a queen? You and the king. Say, Levy, what are you talking about the king? That's attacking the knight. Well, Rook to H1 would now be met with Rook takes F2 check. Now you say, Levy, you led me to believe F3 was going to be played here. F3, I can still come back and I'm still protecting my Rook and you cannot play Rook to D1. So the move Pawn takes F4 actually sets up Rook takes F2 and now King G1 is impossible because of the absolutely shocking queen sacrifice. Takes here. When this pawn, this rook, and this bishop team up against the white king, and actually after, you know, e2 and rook f1, the game is over. So you can't, you can't survive this. So rook h1, rook takes f2, but now there's a backup plan. I can take the rook, but why would I do that when I can throw... Wait. If I throw in the capture over here, the king can come back and guard, right? Wait, this is a problem. Did black just mess up? No. Black knew that 42 years later, he would end up in a YouTube video made by Gotham Chess. He did it for style points. He knew all the way back here, after queen h6 was played, there was no escape for this king, because after rook f2, King F2, Fe3, King G2. Remember that queen sacrifice? Queen takes H1, King takes, and pawn to E2. Have you ever seen something like this? The coolest of pawn moves? White has five pieces, six pieces, not counting the king. And nobody can do a damn thing about pawn to e1 queen game over. Now you say, well, how is that game over? It's not checkmate. Yes, but at this level, it's, it's game over because black would just simply be up a bishop. It would be queen and bishop and pawns versus queen and pawns. The way you would win that is you would either hunt the king down or just win all the pawns, make a second queen and give ladder mate. Look at this position. And the most incredible thing about this position is the fact that, um, well, first of all, there's no way to check the king. There's just no way to do it. Uh, this pawn is actually preventing that. Uh, that would be game over. There's also no way to give perpetual check to black. Like, for example, even if queen d5 was possible, um, this is always check. You see, if this wasn't check, then white could maybe give, like, a perpetual check. But, nope. e2, and one pawn seals the game in amazing fashion. Uh, I had to show this game. Again, shout out to, uh, to Frederick for sending it to me. And, you know, there's a lot of chess games that have been played out there by very good players that we just don't get to see because, first of all, chess exploded in the last, you know, in the, in the pandemic year. And also, chess just, I mean, it's just, it's just how it works, really. Uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of uh, chess content being made that's not being made about the top 100 players in the world. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, let this video serve as a lesson that... Uh, you do not make overly committal decisions before you begin an attack. The move bishop takes g5, if we remember, all the way back here was a bit of an overcommitment. Slow play your attacks, shut down your opponent's counterplay. Um, and when you sacrifice rooks, uh, you know, you got to be careful because you're investing a lot of material into your attacks. But of course, take the simple route. Don't overcomplicate with king to f3. Uh, pawn takes f4 and white would have actually had a pretty decent game, but... Yeah, believe in your pawns. You get eight of them for a reason. And the smallest of pieces can make the biggest of differences. I did not begin this video with anything philosophical in mind, but we are ending this video with something philosophical. And on that note, folks, if there's anything you'd like me to cover in future videos, do let me know in the comments below. Uh, any games that I haven't covered. Um, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out. Get out of here.